Good afternoon, everyone. So extra lecture today to make up for next Thursday, the 17th of June, when I will be actually co-chair to a, an international conference, European Conference on Research Methodologies for Business and Management. So I won't be able to come on Thursday. So today, this lecture from 4.30 to 6.30 is to replace our Thursday, 17th of June lecture, okay? We only have two, two, two students today, Andre Kalishtu and Mikhail Dudak. I believe we're in the right address. Yes, it's the right address. So, our semester is coming to an end. Wait for a few more students to, to arrive. We're recording the session. Hopefully people will be able to come here. Andrea and Mikal, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Anna Salome has just arrived. I don't know if she has audio yet. And Vanda. So a few more students arriving. slowly coming in. Again, I'm recording this session for, for those of you who are not able to participate or come to the lecture today. Wait for a few more minutes. Any questions about anything that we've covered this semester? Does anybody have any questions? I'd like to, to speak to you today a little bit about big data. I think big data is a very, very big topic. Um, there are actually big data um, master's degrees specializing in big data. In Madrid, for example, a friend of mine or a friend of my children, one of my stepchildren is going to Madrid to do a master's in big data. So it might be interesting for you, those of you who are thinking of going on to do a master's degree to consider big data as a, as a, as a profession, okay? So what is big data? Okay. You can see my screen. I think you're getting here. Okay. If you can see my screen, I'll actually share with you on chat. Interesting definition if you want to have a look at that. Hello, Samuel. No. Yeah. Somebody sent me a message on chat. Hello, teacher Samuel. Yes, I think you're probably in the library. I can see you with a mask on. So thank you for coming today. Let me show you the, the screen. Let me see, this is it. Okay. So what is big data? I just sent you a link on chat to have a look at the definition of big data according to Investopedia, which is a cyclopedia or an, uh, a dictionary for investments and linked to business. 
So updated January 1st, 2021. Big data refers to the large diverse sets of information that grow at ever increasing rates exponentially, encompasses the volume of, volume of information, the velocity or speed at which it is created and collected, and the variety or scope of the data points being covered, known as the three Vs of big data. Okay. Link to data mining and arrives in multiple formats. Okay. So please read this website that I've I sent you a link to. Provol language site Mandevs will link. Have a quick look. Definition of big data. Okay. So this link which I showed to you sent to you, please read it. Okay. It's this website. on big data. Volume, velocity, and variety, three Vs. So just as we have the four Ps for product, price, price, place, and promotion, the four Ps of marketing, we also have the three Vs of big data. So you have to memorize those three Vs, volume, velocity, and variety. Okay. So what is big data? Great quantity of diverse information. Can be structured or unstructured. Okay. Nearly every department in a company can utilize findings from big, big data analysis. Public, publicly shared comments, for example, on social networks and websites. So Facebook, Instagram are sources of big data. LinkedIn, what's up to, okay. Voluntary gathered from personal electronics and apps through questionnaires, product purchases and electronic check-ins. Has to do with computer databases analyzed using software specifically designed to handle large complex data sets. So we're not talking about using Excel here, we're talking about using software specifically designed to, to handle large and complex data sets. Okay. When we're speaking about Google, which is actually belongs to the, the Alphabet group, Google and Facebook, they use big data to generate ad revenue, advertising revenue, by placing targeted ads to users on social media and those surfing the web. So when we're talking about targeted advertising, we're talking about big data using social media and surfing the web, all of this, Google and Facebook are very good at, okay? So uses of big data, obviously the purchase history is very important of millions of customers. So how many customers does Amazon have? Millions of customers. One hundred forty-seven million Prime members in the United States. 200 million members in its Prime membership worldwide. Amazon Prime, 200 million. So they'll know the preferences, the purchasing preferences of at least 200 million members. It's a lot, that's big data, okay? Coming back to our, our definition here. Okay. You have to understand that it can be unstructured or structured, depending on how it's organized. Structured big data consists of information already managed by the organization in databases and spreadsheets. So it's organized. Frequently involving numbers. Unstructured is what we can find in social media, for example. Okay. Good for analyzing customer needs. A lot of us actually share public comments on social networks and websites. So this is part of big data. Also personal electronics and apps. We can actually gather questionnaires and other voluntary information. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Any questions so far? Estão a ver ou não? Está aqui a dar problemas aqui na minha internet. My internet has some problems here. Consegue me ouvir? Sim. Sim, ok. É verdade, saíram os resultados do Grace, pelo menos daquilo que eu percebi. Não sei se alguém recebeu alguma coisa. Did anybody receive any results from the Grace competition? Did anybody receive any results? No. No? So there was one group which received a prize, but from the other class. I don't know what prize it is. I actually had a look at another look at the group work, and the group work actually is very good. So I think it was a good choice. Obviously, very, very difficult to choose a winner of a prize from all of the University of Adelaide students, because there's a lot of students doing this group work. But it's actually, uh, I think it was a good choice. A very, very complete work done by some students. Actually, four girls from Industrial Engineering and Management. I can show you their group work afterwards if you like. But it's a very good, solid effort. Mas foi muito sólido. I've been correcting group work from the other. Let me see here. So in terms of methodology, the group which won a prize, they did a survey. It's called Impact of the COVID-19 on the sector of vinhos. Impact of COVID-19 on the wine sector. So wine is something which Portugal is quite good at internationally. Um, so they did a survey with questions on the wine sector and they had 621 answers, 621 respostas on inquérito. They also did an uh, in-depth interview with the commercial director of Adega de Monsan, the Mons Adega de Monsan group. And they also did some other empirical work involving um, what we call direct, a direct communication by another institution, which they also used for their empirical work. But it's an interesting, interesting group work. But unfortunately, not everybody can win a prize or everybody will win a certificate, which you can use for curriculum purposes and for getting into master's degree. So you did officially enter a competition and you did get um, attention by the jury. Not everyone can win a, a, an actual prize. There's only four prizes for, I think it was 88 different group projects or 88 projects different. Entregues, 88 projects given in, and only four prizes for those 88 projects. So it's very difficult to get a prize, and, and I'm sure that it's difficult for the judges to decide which prize to give or to whom they should give it to. Uh, let me have a look here. Yeah, so 88 groups participated. The jury was the subdirector of the Subdirector General do Ensino Superior, Superior Higher Education in Portugal. The subdirector was in, was the jury, one of the juries. Jury members, Angela Noiva, director of B Lab in Portugal, Luiz Amado, subdirector of the Programa de Desenvolvimento Sustentável da Fundação Golbenkian, the Golbenkian Foundation. Subdirector Filipe Saldanha was also on the jury. Two representatives of, of companies, Danone and Group Souza, also were in the jury, and they decided who would win um, a prize this year. Out of the 88 projects, only four will receive a prize, I believe, maybe four or five. And if there are draws, so very much, but I'm not sure. Okay, any questions about that? So unfortunately, this class didn't, this year didn't win a prize. We've won a lot of prizes from this class in previous years. Not to be this year, but there was some, this doesn't mean to say that there wasn't some excellent group work, which there was, or excellent trabalhos de grupo entregues. Very, very good work given in, okay? So coming back to our big data discussion, advantages and disadvantages. So there's going to be a lot of data which we can have on our customers and potential customers, customers who might buy from us in the future, don't yet buy from us. This allows us an opportunity to tailor our products and marketing efforts 
to achieve greater satisfaction or greater customer satisfaction, which will lead to repeat business or greater loyalty, if you like. Repeat business is not really the same as loyalty, but it can be in interpreted as such. With the amount of personal data available on individuals today, um, it's important that we're able to effectively manage big data and not be you know, suffocated or you know, completely crushed by all of this data and information. Okay, so we need a good way to analyze and manage everything that we receive digitally, mainly digitally. Every credit quite cards, credit card swipe, credit or multibank or debit card swipes. Every time we access the internet with our smartphones, every time we access social media, Facebook or Instagram, everything is registered. Excuse me, everything we access on Facebook, every time we do a like, it's registered. Every time we do a comment on Facebook, it's liked, it's, it's registered. So there's a lot of unstructured data and structured data. Excuse me, so unstructured data in, in also includes emails, videos, and text documents. It's very complex to analyze the data in a video. It's complex to analyze the data in an email. But all of this is now possible with artificial intelligence and has to be analyzed very actually quite sophisticatedly or with a lot of sophistication to you know to reach a specific conclusion okay so any questions about this i think i can export this article or the the, the address is on is in the slides anyway i'll send you the slides oracle.com oracle which is a very very big technology company they also do a, an interesting piece on big data, if I can access it here. Accept all cookies. So what is big data? Again, they speak about the three Vs, you have to memorize that. Variety, volume, velocity. Okay. So big data, greater variety of information. Just on Facebook, you might have your likes, your comments, your posts, um, your reactions to certain advertisements. So all of this is what we call big data. Tremendous volume. If we have, if we consider all of the consumers in Portugal, we could be considering seven, eight or nine or 10 million consumers. If you're considering consumers in the United States and they're considering hundreds of millions of consumers, so to, be, to be able to analyze all of that is what we call big data, okay? So we'll need, there'll be a lot of variety, there'll be, there'll be a lot of volume, and there'll be velocity. Okay, I have to do it quickly. So these are the three Vs. Do you study big data in any other subjects on your master's degree? Stood on big data, not as only that's class, the was on your on your undergraduate degree, no was a licensed student? Yes, I studied in the technology of systems information this year. Falamos um bocadinho. Isso é com o Daniel Polónia? A professora Raquel Madreira. Ah, Madreira, Raquel Madreira, incrível. Ela é engenheira. She's an engineer from industry. She has a lot of industry, industry experiences. I actually like her very much. She's a very nice lady. Very knowledgeable. And she's PhD, I believe, in eletrónica from the Departamento de Eletrónica. So, yes, she's, she's very, very, very knowledgeable. Anyway, there's a definition here of the three Vs. So volume, the amount of data matters. With big data, you'll have to process high volumes of low density, unstructured data. Unstructured, we're not sure, you know, it's not, it's not already in a database. It's not already in a spreadsheet. So Twitter data feeds, Twitter, there's some important activity on Twitter this weekend or this, this holiday. Um, quick streams on a web page or mobile app, different types of data, which we're talking about terabytes of data, terabits hundreds of petabytes. So this is very, very big volumes. In terms of velocity, um, that's how it relates to the speed in which we receive and then act on this information. Um, directly has to do with, you know, how fast the data streams directly into memory versus being written to disk. Okay, so it couldn't be real time or near real time. As soon as it happens, we might be analyzing it. So very, very interesting um, software and computer capabilities to be able to analyze very quickly big data. Then we have variety. So not, not really talking about a relational database type of data. 
think about unstructured and semi-structured text, audio, video. I'm sure that you on Facebook or even on Instagram, I don't really use Instagram very, very much. I'm trying to change, but I'm a Facebook dinosaur. But they do do face recognition. So if I have a photograph with family members or friends, then Facebook will give me their names automatically. They get them right, I'd say 90, 95% of the time. So face recognition on Facebook is very, very advanced. So they can actually see on a video with this sort of, with, with different techniques, what um, sort of information we're talking about, okay? So um, value and veracity. These are what we call the fourth and fifth V. So if you like, we have the three Vs here, and then two more Vs, value and veracity. So you might think, you know, data, we can have a lot of data, but you know, is it, does it have any value for us? So we have to discover that we have to discover the value in the data which we receive. Okay. How reliable is it? How truthful is it? Okay. So big data is more valuable than oil. Remember what Brittany Kaiser said on, on, on the video, the Great Hack video. Everybody saw the Great Hack video? Or somebody at least saw the trailer? Everybody remembers the Great Hack video. I think I think some of you probably saw it, not all of you. But she did say that data information is more valuable than oil at the moment. So it's the most valuable resource on earth, which Facebook has a lot of, Google and Alphabet have a lot of. So that's why they are such they're so successful in terms of you know, market value and profit every year. So it's because of the evolution, exponential evolution of technological breakthroughs that we've been able to store much more information and then compute it, analyze that information. So if it wasn't for the advances in technology, big data analysis would not be possible. And actually the price of big, big data analysis has come down very, very much. It's much more accessible and it's actually very accurate and very good for business decision support for decision support okay so finding value you have to analyze it but then it's a discovery process it's like looking at statistical data statistically we're not sure what a survey can tell us until we analyze the data so you have to recognize patterns ask the right questions even if you're doing a statistical analysis you have to decide which sort of analysis you should do and then predict behavior in the future, okay? So value and veracity, how much can you rely on the data? How truthful is your data? And then all data has intrinsic value, but you have to discover that value. So value and veracity, the fourth and fifth V. We'll be, I'll be asking you some questions about this uh, later on if you like, later on in the lecture. Anyway, so the history of big data. So it's a new phenomenon. The origins go back 40 or 50 years or to the 1960s, 1970s. So that's when the first data centers were coming into existence and the first relational databases. So Oracle is not blowing its own horn, but Oracle is one of the, the first original, if not the first um, relational databases to have, to have appeared, okay? So Oracle is obviously very big on, on big data. So Facebook, YouTube, and other online services so there's a lot of data on YouTube. It's a question of being able to analyze it, store it, and then you know, discover the value even in YouTube data. Hadoop and Spark apparently are new open source fra frameworks and essential for the growth of big data. So if you perhaps want to write this down, Hadoop and Spark, recent open source frameworks, essential for the growth of big data so they can make big data easier, easier to work with, cheaper to store. So it's well worth having a look at these. When they say open source, it's normally for free. And we can have a look at Hadoop, it might be a good here, Hadoop software. Collection of open source software utilities that facilitates using a network of many computers to solve problems involving massive amounts of data and computation. Okay. So if you do go to a, a job interview and they ask you about big data, then you might want to mention Hadoop. Okay. Apache Hadoop. 
has to do with large data sets. So, so at least 3.2.2. used by a lot of companies and organizations, <laughs> excuse me, users encouraged to add themselves to the Hadoop powered by Wikipage. Okay, so this is the Hadoop software and they also have Spark. Let's just have a look at Spark. Let's see what it says here. Open source unified analytics engine for large scale data processing. Okay. For programming entire clusters and with implicit data parallelism and fault tolerance. So it makes sense that you mentioned big data in Technologies d'Information. The Technologies, I know that it's on the Sensitura just now. What is the name of the Technologies? Technologies and systems in management information systems. Technologies, is it management information systems and technologies? That's it. So you have something around big, big data here. Okay. So very interesting. This is from the Anu. So and second year. So you're having you're doing it this semester. Don't forget this semester. No, just having it this semester. So very good. Very interesting. Coming back to our slides. So, what is big data? According to Siegel, 2019, actually the, the information has been updated to 2021. This is a definition of big data. Big data refers to the large diverse sets of information that grow at ever increasing rates, encompasses the volume, the velocity or speed which is created and collected and the variety of scope of the data often comes from multiple sources and arrives in multiple formats, which we will have to manage and make intelligible for our business uses. Okay. Question. Oops. Are you able to answer this question? Anybody? Anybody feel like answering this? Talvez a Cia. Cia. Yes, look, C looks correct to me. Data can be structured, which is true, but it can also be unstructured. Data can be atomic, this is something to mislead you. Data can be reminiscent, symbiotic, so these are all a little bit creative. But it is, in fact, answer C, which is correct. Big data can be categorized as unstructured or structured. Structured data consists of you know, whatever's already in databases and spreadsheets, numeric information, unstructured has to do with social media, information on customer needs, okay, different sources other than databases and spreadsheets. What about this one? B. Again? I think the answer is B. B. I think I think so too. So I've been a bit um, creative here with my V's. So answer B is correct. So it's about volume, velocity, and variety, as we saw. Three B's which characterize big data: volume, ver velocity, and variety. What about this? The answer is F, all of the above are true. Yeah, I also agree that it's F. Okay. 
I think people are answering in the chat here. Three answers. C, yes, that's true. Then F, yes, okay, that's Samuel. Okay. Question, another question four here. So, so far you're doing very well. These are also very basic questions, but you're still doing very well. So let's have a look here. Big data A is still too early and firms that specialize in managing this type of data do not exist, it's not true. Even Cambridge Analytic, which since disappeared when bankrupt, was an example of a firm to manage big data. Okay. B, C, Big data refers to the large homogeneous, it's not homogeneous sets of information. The information can actually be very different, very a big variety. Okay. Um, mathematicians who then analyze it using Excel is not normally what we would use to analyze big data. So big data is most often stored in computer databases and is analyzed using software specifically to the higher. So D is correct. Big data refers to the large diverse sets of information that grow at ever increasing rates. So this is a correction of the homogeneous aspect. It's actually diverse sets of information, not homogeneous. Then actually we use software specifically designed to handle large complex data sets. Many software as a service SAAS companies specialize in managing this type of complex data. So it's not, we're not really talking about Excel here. So D, is correct. Big data is most often stored in computer databases and analyzed using specific software. Okay. Everyone's in agreement that it's D, Tajin Sadakurl. Question five. Somebody's answered here on chat. Samuel thinks it's A. Does anybody else agree with A? Anybody else agree with A? B is of course not correct because big data once gathered is immediately actionable. So no, yeah, it's not only about gathering this information, it's about discovering the value in the information. So B is not correct. C is not, not correct also because all sorts of departments can use big data, not only marketing and sales. Marketing and sales too, but not only marketing and sales. The goal of big data is simply to increase the speed at which products get to market. Is that the, the sole goal of big data? So Samuel is right. It's actually answer A. Uses of big data by turning it into actionable information. Okay. The goal is to increase the speed, target orders, and to ensure customers remain satisfied. So it's not only to increase speed, okay? It's to reduce the amount of time and resources required to gain market adoption, thus on the market. Target audiences is about getting to the right audiences and to ensure that customers remain satisfied. So it's not only about increasing speed, okay? So looking here, the only one which is true is A. Okay. Correlation means to see whether there is an association or a relationship. I think you've studied this in your statistics class or methods quantitative applications. Whether a correlation exists. 
another multiple choice question. So you've got everyone correct so far, or some of you have got one correct, everyone, every question correctly so far. So according to Samuel Fabry G, which is all of the above are true. Okay. I actually agree with that. All of these answers are true. Very high velocity can be structured or unstructured, the big data. Every department, practically every department in a company can utilize big data analysis. There's gonna be a lot of information, clutter and noise. So yes, big data can also create overload. Structured data, numeric, can be easily stored and sorted. Unstructured data, such as emails, videos, and text documents, may require more sophisticated techniques to be applied before it becomes useful. So analyzing emails and videos has to use sophisticated techniques for analysis. So all of the above are true, okay? What about this, true or false? This is easier with the true or false. I can actually bring together different questions to make a multiple choice, true or false. Okay, for this, what are the or false? Do you think big data is larger, more complex data sets? So this is something new, possible, made possible by technology. New data sources, for example, social media is one of the most important sources of big data. If I go onto my Facebook page, okay, have a look here. Somebody said something on chat. True, yes, it's true, it is true. But if you go to my, I, we can go to my LinkedIn page. So this is what my LinkedIn page looks like. Okay. Colleague from Ishkte, Marius Esos is gonna be a keynote speaker at, at a APG talk. Okay. Everything that I say, you know, that I like will be registered and collected. Okay, if I go to my LinkedIn homepage, there's an information here on how many post views, search appearances, okay. Give these 2,200 post views, let's have a look. They will register who looks at my views, at my posts. They'll register who I'm friends with, who I interact the most with. Okay. And these are my recent posts from, I don't post too much on, on LinkedIn. Okay. This is to help. Two months ago, I had tried to help a student of mine get some answers to some sort of research we were doing. Okay. Miguel Monteiro, this is my activity, so I, I recently commented on this. Miguel Monteiro, who's an engineering, industrial engineering and management student, so he's in the other class. New European champion of shot put, in English, English, I'm a shot put, lançamento de peso, 
F quadrant category. Okay. This happened between the 1st and 5th of May. So I said, congratulations. So this is registered. Okay. Some interesting information here and the analysis of this will all be big data. So let's have a look here. Coming back to our big data slide. So this is true. Let's see if I can share this. Okay. This is true. What about this one? Really? Yes, it's true too. So massive volumes of data with technology available today, we can actually address business problems. Excuse me, wouldn't have been, wouldn't have been able to tackle before. So this is true. Okay. What about talk about the five V's here? The, the main three V's: volume, velocity, and variety. Two more Vs, vacancy and vortex. Does that sound correct? Please correct if false. What do you think? If you're not sure, we can go back to our website here, the Oracle website. So two more Vs have emerged. We have the three Vs, volume, velocity, and variety. So volume is because there's a lot of, a lot of data. Velocity, you have to treat it quickly or analyze it quickly. Variety, all sorts of different types of structured and unstructured data, or unstructured, unstructured data. The value and truth of big data. So the value, so it has to have value for us and has to be true rather than false. So value and veracity seem to be the, the other two Vs. Valor y veracidad, can we trust the data? Is it truthful? So looky here, does that seem to be correct or false? Being a bit create, creative here with the vacancy in the vortex. They do start with V, but they are obviously false. So we have to discover the value, how truthful our data is how much we can rely on it, value and veracity, okay? What about this one? Sorry about that, thank you. So with the previous one, Three Vs of big data, volume, velocity and variety, vacancy and vortex, obviously an invention. The other two Vs have to do with how truthful your data is and the value, which we have to discover in the data. So it's about value, valor and veracity, veracidad. This one is about big data becoming, has become capital, more valuable than oil. So I suggest that those two software um, suites that we, we saw, a good idea to remember them and maybe have a look at those. Okay. And there are some very, very big tech companies which are able to use data to their advantage. So this is this true or not true? We're being constantly analyzed. Not us personally, if we're not very famous or if we're not in politics, but still for commercial purposes, most of our data is analyzed. So this is actually true. Sergeant Pursville, no, nobody has any queries on this. Big data has become capital. Think of some of the world's largest tech companies. Okay, also used to develop new products. 
look at this one. Recent technological breakthroughs have exponentially increased the cost of data storage. Is this true or not? So my telephone has 512 gigabytes. Is the cost of storage going up or coming down? I said something here on chat. So is it getting more expensive to store or less expensive? Remember that I bought a IBM in 1987, 5,000 euros for PC. Okay, how much memory did it have? 60 megabytes. Okay. So now for 1,500 euros or 1,000, let's be a bit, 1,600 euros, you can buy a smartphone. Okay. We, One thousand six hundred euros. You can buy a smartphone with five hundred and twelve gigabytes. So cheaper actually makes phone calls. It's a computer it makes phone calls. So looking here, recent technological breakthroughs have exponentially increased the cost of, or decreased the cost of data storage and computations. Why is data big data become interesting? Because of the lowering of the cost. That's what's made it more interesting. Okay. Somebody said something on chat. It's decreased, exactly, yes. So instead of increased, it's decreased the cost of data storage. So let's have a look at the answer, it's false. So exponentially reduce the cost of data storage and computations. So it's easier and less expensive to store vast amounts of data. Big data is now cheaper, more accessible. Okay. I think this is now the last question, last true or false question, ultima pregunta, so big data. So it's just to give you an idea about what big data is all about. Anybody want to? Verdadeiro. Yes, it's true, okay. So it's not only about analyzing, which is a, a whole other benefit, it's about discovering you know, value. So you need an insightful analyst. It's like going to the psychiatrist. If the psychiatrist is not good at analyzing, it's just a waste of money. So insightful analysts, social perspective, people with a good perspective, business users, executives to write, ask the right questions, recognize patterns, make informed assumptions and predict behavior. Okay. So this is true. I'll send you these slides. So, I mean, we can have a look here again. This is what, let me see if I can share this. We can just look at this for a couple of minutes before we have a break. This is what big data is all about. Who has seen an advertisement that has convinced you that your microphone is listening to your conversations? All of your interactions, your credit card swipes, web searches, locations, likes, they're all collected in real time into a trillion dollar a year industry. Game changer was Cambridge Analytica. They worked for the Trump campaign and for the Brexit campaign. They started using information warfare. Cambridge Analytica claimed to have 5,000 data points on every American voter. I started tracking down all these Cambridge Analytica ex employees. Someone else that you should be calling to the committee is Brittany Kaiser. 
Anthony Kaiser, once a key player inside Cambridge Analytica, casting herself as a whistleblower. The reason why Google, Facebook are the most powerful companies in the world is because last year data surpassed oil in value. Data is the most valuable asset on earth. We targeted those whose minds we thought we could change until they saw the world the way we wanted them to. I do know that their targeting tool was considered a weapon. There is a possibility that the American public had been experimented on. This is becoming a criminal matter. When people see the extent of the surveillance, I think they're going to be shocked. And I still fear for your life. Yeah. With the powerful people that are involved. But I can't keep quiet just because it'll make powerful people I, I, mad. Data rights should be considered just fundamental rights. This is about the integrity of our democracy. These platforms which were created to connect us have now been weaponized. It's impossible to know what is what because nothing is what it seems. So for those of you who already seen it, that's, I think it's good. Those of you who still have not managed to see the documentary, I think it's very important that you see it. Let's see here. Having a look at Netflix. Oops. Netflix is a worldwide entertainment channel streaming if you go on netflix let me have a look here at my we have a a family you will conquer constantinople the land of the world i just walked from a dream so my okay so here it is About the dark side of social media. So, 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 so. Who has seen an app? Oops. If you don't have Netflix, I can lend you my account if you like. I have five or six, I'm not sure, four or five. So it's very interesting. I mean, it goes into different. Okay. Let's go back to that. <laughs> it wasn't that long ago. Just a decade. So not turning up. Can't see the image. Data as well. If you were a friend of somebody who used. It's not much time to imagine such a thing. But anyway, it's about how they changed the Brexit campaign. How well, the Brexit they don't go into very much detail about that, but they do mention how Donald Trump was was elected because they bombarded people who were not really the persuadables they're not sure about what they want to vote they bombarded them with a lot of bad media on hillary clinton a lot of a lot of a lot of which was not true okay so good idea to get onto netflix and watch this it's very very so i think it's one or one and a half hours it's a couple of years old already but it's a good documentary on just you know how much they how much information they get they have on us okay Actually, um, I'll just show you this very quickly. They actually edited a book, Detail Lever, about the top 10 challenges of big data analytics with a colleague of mine, Maria Zez Souza. He's a North American um, editor or publisher. Top 10 challenges of Oops. The big data analytics. So it's a very, very current topic. So big data is new and increasingly present. Many domains has to do with advances in technology and the ability to analyze very large and unstructured data sets like on social media, which is very, very interesting. Even also what we analyze on Google, what's, able, what's possible to analyze on Google um, with the search search engines registering of our all of our questions they'll never forget by the way 
So organizational processes, people, skills, technologies, methodologies, big data analytics combines all of this for strategic and tactical decisions, including in marketing or regarding marketing. Marketing is strategic. According to Peter Drucker, the late Peter Drucker, but he, he actually said that there are only, only two activities which are really distinguishing in firms are marketing and innovation. So marketing, very, very strategic. Data management methods for collecting, organizing, and storing data, analytical queries, reporting, and visualizing, also very important, the visual analytics, and the analytic techniques for predicting the future. Who is going to vote for whom, for Donald Trump, for Brexit, so they're able to predict the outcomes of any sort of activity, okay? So social networks have led to new data possibilities. We're able now to micro segment markets. Before we'd have you know, broad segments, now we can go become very, very specific. And we can actually micro segment to the, to the level of the individual citizen, which is what happens on Facebook. So if I go on my Facebook page and I have a look at my advertisements in my newsfeed, let me have a look here what I have. So, suggested groups golf rules i'm a golfer so they suggest golf rules um actually some interesting feeds here they suggest new friends for me another advert here golf tv so again golf which is one of my pastimes less and less i play less and less golf but i used to be quite a good golfer okay Another sponsored advert is about classical music. My children, I have three, three, well, four children, three play classical music. So they're very informed with their adverts on my Facebook page. So social networks, micro segmentation. We do live in a period of self-indulgence. What does that mean? It means that everybody wants to be indulged. We all want to have a great life. You know, everything that life has to offer, we all want to have our needs catered to. Where can we use big data? Or is where is where is big data being used? Huge um, different fields of research: healthcare and the pharmaceutical sector, the education sector, okay. entrepreneurship, innovation, and strategy, and also in government. They used to, there's an old, there's a saying about um, imposts, taxes. They know everything that we do. Everything that we pay with a credit card, debit card. They know our salary. They know how much money is getting into our account, how much money is leaving our accounts. So especially the tax authorities, autoridades tributarias, they know everything about us. They're able to profile us. Artificial intelligence is very, very active. And this is all for making predictions, for the previsões. Okay, so there's many different methodologies for this. And big data analytics actually can assist any industry. Imagine we want to recruit somebody. We can do a query on LinkedIn and we can gather dozens or hundreds of different candidates, possible good candidates for our company, okay? So we can use big data analytics to figure out where our weakness, weaknesses lie, to solve problematic situations, okay? Um, key strategy nowadays to use big data, so you should be able to identify the different softwares used. I think possibly Pro Professor Heikel Madure will go into that. And it's about incorporating predictive analytical methods to recognize possible future improvements, also regarding innovation, okay? Accurate and useful information through big data analytics. Multiple approaches as about descriptive and inductive statistics. We did do some inductive statistics to identify patterns. For example, the chi-square statistic is an inductive statistics method, statistic inductiva. Descriptive statistics has to do with percentages and different graphs which you can use or create after analyzing data. Estimation techniques, for example, regression analysis. I'm not sure if you was fazing regressões in your unit. Métodos quantitativos aplicados à gestão, something like that. So data, quantitative methods for business and management. They will, you'll do a lot of estimation about the future, regression. So there's new organizational strategies also to support um, the policy agenda. And a viragem política para um lado ou para o outro, policy agenda has 
is also based on big data analytics. Okay, so this is just a presentation of a book which we did recently. This is from this year. Okay. So, if you have a, a five or six minute break, we have a quick break. Yes, Mr. Kanino. Okay, so nine minutes until 20 to four. So just be back in about nine, nine minutes, okay? Till 20 to four, 20 to six, sorry. There are six minutes left. So I'll just pause the, the recording here. Resuming our recording of our session here for those of you who could not come. So there's an interesting article which I wrote about technology Excuse me, and regarding millennials, you're all millennials, I'm sure you're aware of this. Let me see if I can find the article. Send it to you for you to have a quick look at the abstract. about millennials and how you've changed due to technology. So it has to do with some of the big data issues we've been discussing. Let me just find it here. Just send that to you via chat. So how's the millennial generation, which is the generation which is up and coming, they've already arrived in the marketplace some a few years ago, actually. Um, we can have a look here at the article. Just looking here at what millennials are like. Excuse any solid abstract. Just please read the abstract. So millennials interact with technology like no other generation before them. You're actually the first generation to have internet everywhere. My generation or generation X did not have the internet available as you have had. You don't remember practically having not having any access to the internet, I believe. Okay. According to leadership, if you're leading a marketing department, um, if you perhaps will become a leader of a marketing department. You perhaps do not want to know what, what business is like. There's a lot of cutthroat activity going on, a lot of backstabbing. Millennials want to be treated authentically, forma authentica, and as valued human beings. So you don't want to have autocratic or paternalistic leaders. So the autocratic leadership profile currently found in many Portuguese organizations is not what you want to have when you reach the business environment. This study actually involved a sample of 111 millennial students who answered a survey on attitudes towards leadership. Okay. We also, I also did, or we also did three interviews with seasoned executive, executives about their perspectives. So hardworking millennials is what we see to exist now, even though previous research says that millennials are lazy, which I don't think is the case. Finally, information technology is a pressure, precious partner in class. Obviously, classes have changed since this article was written in 2018. We've since had the COVID-19 pandemic, so I don't really use Padlet.com too much because we can project slides on, mood, on, on Zoom. But I used to use a lot of Padlet.com for online interaction during class, Moodle, online news forums, 
creation of videos. I don't think you have too much time to create videos this semester, but uh, I've, I've done that in the past, having students create advertising advertising videos, for example, videos the the news Okay. Social media has made technology much more transparent. Employers wanting more democratic leaders. When I was your age, 2021, 18, 19, or 2021, we didn't have any contact with lecturers. We didn't have cell phones. We didn't have internet, no social media. So we saw our lecturers during class, and that was it. As soon as, as the lecturer left, the teacher left the room, we wouldn't see him again until the next lecture. There's no way to contact him or her. We only had fixed phones, no smartphones, nothing like that. So technology has made trans society more transparent. We can just get information on each other very easily. Okay. And hierarchies today are not seem to be very welcomed by millennials. We don't really want, millennials don't want to see hierarchies in business and not in the classroom either. So um, regarding innovation, just to give you some pointers, okay. on the management of innovation and technology. Let me just share this here with you. Just just to try and point you in the right direction. Being millennials without reading the article, you should be able to answer this. And according to what I said, so millennials have difficulty interacting with technology. Obviously this is not true for you because you have all of the facilidades or all of the easiness, ease of interaction with technology. Surprisingly, this is actually true. Some of you in my survey, you don't really want to know the truth of what happens in the business environment. Some people prefer to be kept naive or ingenuous regarding what to expect after graduating. I even have some very, very good teacher, colleague of mine, very nice lady. She also says students have enough time, plenty of time to, to, to discover what the, the, the business world is like, let them live in their relative ignorance, my ignorancia relativa, regarding what the business environment is actually like. Millennials do not value being treated authentically. This is not true. You want to be treated authentically and you do not want to be treated aut autocratically. So out of all of these, there's only really one, according to the study, which is true, which is answer B, okay? So it's B. Seem to be nice by some millennials. Not all millennials want to be kept in the dark. I think touched Kenny that as scooters, but a lot want to be rather positive about what they might encounter later on in the work environment. Technologies made society more transparent. Technology is welcome in class. I mean, we had we're having a, an online lecture today no physical contact the only contact is over the internet and with zoom and technology colibri according to myers and saragiani 2010 the millennial generation is lazy hmm. i don't agree with that i think you're actually very hard working a lot of you are very hard working but i only have we only have 10 10 participants in class today 10 or 9 there used to be 11 and we've lost somebody along the line lost somebody but uh, so nine students so in, an, in a universe of 60 or 70, we've lost a lot of people today, but that's why we're recording the, the, the lecture also because some people are just not able to come. Anyway, authentic leadership style predominates in Portuguese organizations. Unfortunately, this is not true. There's a lot of autocratic leadership, which is not really seen to be authentic. So millennial generation is lazy, lazy according to Myers and Saragiani. I don't agree with this, but this is a, 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 um, a very common you know, conclusion about the millennial generation. What about this one? Somebody's answered here with chat. Why not D? Coming back to this one. And because technology, D is not correct here because technology has made society more transparent. We know a lot about each other without um, without technology, this wouldn't be possible. It's like the big data and the great hack. They know everything about us. They know everything that, you know, our preferences, who we're married to, where we live, what sort of device we use, electronics devices, 
type of computer, type of smartphone, what time we're online, what time we go to sleep, what time we wake up, which social media we use, who we interact with, who are our friends, what do we like, what do we dislike. So that's why it's not D. Do you agree, Samuel? Okay. Opaque means you cannot see through it. It's the opposite of transparent. That's what it means. Okay. So what about this one? Which one? Oh, somebody said something here in chat. Okay, so you agree. Okay, Samuel. What about this one? This one is quite in, quite easy. Actually, you, you're not given the definition of, well, internet has not changed society. This, I mean, could not be more untrue. No puede decir mientras verdad. The internet has changed society completely. Even in the midst of a pandemic, we found ways to keep on buying and keeping the, the economy going. Online deliveries, online orders of you know commercial items, clothing to food. Communication over the internet is expensive. Actually, this is not true. It's very cheap. I mean, you have to have an internet connection, but it's actually very cheap to communicate over the internet. Before, I used to have a for me to have a sales meeting in Spain would be very expensive. I don't. When I worked for Waterco, I'd have to travel 800 or 900 kilometers to meet with somebody in Barcelona or something, a thousand kilometers. Time consuming, dangerous. Today I can just do it on Zoom or on Microsoft Teams. I just didn't have the technology know-how at the time. And my, my company sent me for face-to-face -face meetings, which today are just not necessary. Just do it over the internet. And a lot of you know master's dissertation and public defenses, physics publicas demonstrad, PhD defenses, physics publicas doutrimento, just do it on the internet. And it's opened up a whole new possibility. I mean, we can now interact with teachers and jury members from very easily from the Algarve, from Leiria, from Viana de Castel. They can all be at a Fiesa Demonstrado or a master's defense or PhD defense over the internet. Okay. Discussion in class should not use technological tools. This is not true. Be as technological as you can. Why not? Millennials are very good with that. Millennials born in or after 1992. All of you probably born in or after 1992, but the actual definition in the article is 1982. So um, in your 30s, late 30s, the, the, the older millennials will be approaching 40 years of age. So none of the answers are true because this here should be 1982. Some people say 1981, others 1984. Excuse me, but generally speaking, millennials born in the 1980s until the end of the 21st century. Until, um, actually, so actually, you're not, how old, you, when were you born? 1999, 2000, when were you born? Those of you in class? Uh, 2001. 2001, so you're actually younger than what I thought. So my students are, so 1996, Samuel, so Samuel Fabri is definitely a millennial. Rui George, 2000, so borderline there. Rui George, ali na, na transição, generation Y to generation Z, or the millennial generation just transitioning there. Um, those of you born in 2001 also, probably now considered to be generation Z, generation Z. So time flies and my students are also getting, my students are actually the same age. I'm getting older. That's, I think that's the, the answer to that. Anyway, millennials, comfortable disrupting the norm. True or not? Millennials' grandparents more open to trying out new products. I think we've seen a transformation in society. Definitely um, people are more comfortable being different men marrying men, women marrying women, and we see all sorts of tattoos and, and piercings and different clothing now, very, all very normal. So I'd say that we have to, we'd have to agree with Jordan here. Millennials are comfortable disrupting the norm, no doubt about it. New different, different types of jobs, different types of hobbies. Um, millennials' grandparents more open. This is not true. Uh, as, we people, as people get older, they become more close to trying out new products. So this one's not true. Millennials are the second generation 
to grow up with the internet. Actually, if you are not a millennial, then you will be the second generation to grow up with the internet everywhere. The millennials were the first generation to grow up with the internet everywhere. So the Z generation born 2000, 2001, 2002 are the second generation to grow up with the internet everywhere. Being tech savvy gives no advantage to millennials. This is not true. The more you are able to use technology in the workplace, the better for your careers. So D is not correct. B is not correct. C is not correct. B, I think it's actually A, which is the, the correct answer. So it is, you are comfortable disrupting the norm or millennials such as some will be, will be fine being different. I think people from my generation more used to being sheep or carneiros, more, more the same to each other and the millennials a little bit different. What about this one? Do you only follow rich and famous people as a millennial? Are you able to follow anyone which you which you have an interest or who you have who you have an interest in? Millennials let friends come first. What do you think? So which one looks correct here? Okay. Qual é que acham que está correct? Which one looks to be correct? Does anybody have a suggestion for this? Give you a, uh, help here on, on B. Millennials seem to be very, very selfish, especially in the USA. USA is a very individualistic culture. So millennials let friends come first in the USA. Not true, not according to Safer. Millennials seem to be very selfish, especially in the USA. Millennials only rock, only follow rich and famous people. This um, not true either, because actually the millennials will follow a lot of digital influencers who do not have to be rich and famous. As long as it's somebody they see an interest or have a, something they connect to, they can connect to them, they will follow them. What about reading more and more text? What did Neil Patel say about text and the narrative online? Is there a tendency to read more or less text? Mean. So this one's not this one's not also correct because there is definitely a tendency to read less text and to watch more videos, listen to more podcasts, but less text. Baby boomers, which are actually the generation before mine, I'm considered to be Generation X. Millennials from 1980 to 2000, Generation Y, and then from 2000 up to 2000, I mean for another 10, 15 years, the Generation Z. So baby boomers older than me are not similar to millennials and not also enthusiastic about technological advances. My parents, for example, are not so at ease with technology as millennials. So which one seems to be true? This one's not true. This one's not true. This one's not true. So it looks to be none of the answers are true. Okay, Concordo, do you agree with that? Okay. Another question here. Do you work well in a team? What do you think, millennials? Do you work well in a team? No problems actually with the groups this semester in marketing management. Not problems in your groups. I think they all of the millennials or the Z generation got on well together. What about having a desire to have a good impact on their organizations? I think that there's a lot of ambition. I saw a lot of people wanted to do well in their group work. I also had a lot of meetings online, a lot of WhatsApp messages exchanged with students, a lot of emails. So they communicate openly, but not frequently. This is not true. I think millennials like to communicate openly and also frequently with their, with their bosses or their colleagues. Okay. What about millennials lacking in loyalty? Myers and Sarajiani, 2010. This is interesting because it is actually true. According to Myers and Sarajiani, uh, millennials lack in loyalty. What does this mean? It means that 
if millennials or you know the internet generation finds a good product something better than what they used to then they'll change no problem it doesn't mean that they're, they're bad people it just means that there's perhaps less loyalty being technology lovers you can recognize if something is different and better so one of the explanations why probably students in class today do not use nokia telephones because nokia telephones were seen to be superseded overtaken by samsung or apple or huawei xiaomi so nokia has been left behind so there's no real loyalty to former products so this is the one which is actually correct millennials lacking loyalty according to myers and sadachi okay what about this one what about this question here Which one looks to be correct? Well, like, but it's not correct. Actually, millennials in the USA um, have less competencies when compared to other countries. The USA is not what it used to be. And I think they're losing ground and terrain to a lot of different other countries. Millennials lack soft skills. If you think about it, and you see millennials and especially the younger generations or what are compared to me as being younger generations, always on technology, always on their smartphones, even during dinner and lunchtime, I'd say that this is an indication that millennials lack soft skills. And it seemed to be quite rude to be on your cell phone during dinner, especially if you're with strangers or with people you do not know very well, or my city mania. So um, millennials, millennials lack soft skills is actually true. Millennials in the USA have more competences when compared to other countries is not true. Motivation, um, one of the reasons I think that the millennials that I um, surveyed are not lazy because they recognize, the millennials I, I surveyed recognize the importance of motivation. Motiva sound motivation is the, is the most essential aspect or ingredient for success according to my study, okay, or our study. Being street savvy is very important. But according to our study, is actually the second most important indicator of success. Street savvy is expertise at rua to be able to, you know, not be tricked to understand how the world works. Not academic um, intellectuality, if you like, or into being an intellectual in an academic sense is different to being street savvy. Being intelligent is the most important ingredient for success. Actually, the millennials don't agree with this. They see that motivation is much more important than being intelligent, which is actually probably true. Because if you're intelligent, but you don't work, if you don't read, or if you don't try hard, then you will lose to people who are more motivated. So discussing this millennials like soft skills is the true answer here in this A, B, C, D, E, F, G. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven answers here. Set respostas possíveis, seven possible answers. This is what your test is gonna be like with six or seven possible answers. I will not discount for wrong answers. But this is the sort of question that you will be expecting. Okay. What about this one? Somebody's asked a question here. Rui Jorge Rivera disagrees with this sentence. Millennials like soft skills. Okay, that's fine. Let me see. I think if we go to the article here. Just to put it into perspective, uh, in my opinion, millennials are like uh, the people who, which have the the more soft skills because uh, from one, from my few experience, I feel like older people like even more the soft skills we need in the market. So uh, because as I see, older bosses tend to have less soft skills and and. Uh, mainly bad leaders as we see uh, that the 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 greater leaders in our society are becoming even younger so i i don't agree with the sentence that millennials lack soft skills i think we're we're seeing a pattern in which they uh, 
even more have uh, even more lots of skills. But that's just my opinion. That's fine. That's fine. It's no problem. So there's a lot of um, soft skills development courses are available now. My experience with students at the University of Aveiro, not too much with other universities, even though I do lecture at a uni another university, University of Portugalians and the, the doctorate level, they're older students. There is a lot of emphasis on soft skills, soft skills, soft skills. So if you ask me whether the Portuguese are better than the Germans at soft skills, I'd say yes, we're better than the Germans at soft skills. But there is a lot of literature which does say that, um, I mean, you can obviously disagree with this, so despite millennials having grown up with the information and with information, to, uh, oh, not, not showing this, hold on a second. Let's see here. This is what the article, so I mean, if you look at the question, According to my article or our article, um, there is an indication that millennials lack soft skills. Okay, but I mean, you can have your own opinion. Okay, but yeah, I'm not talking about differences between cultures or countries. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about generally speaking, because uh, in my opinion, the, the work market is, is uh, getting even more differentiated due to the fact that uh, people that leave university and, and finish their, grad, their undergraduates or master's degrees, they they are even more qualified in soft skills and i think we we as students have to differentiate a lot uh, on that because everyone has an art skill so to speak because uh, everyone nowadays has a, a bachelor or or even a master so maybe the soft skills could be decisive on a recruitment process for example so in my opinion we do not like lack soft skills we even more the millennials even more uh, have soft skills when it comes to older people but that's just my opinion i'm not putting uh, criticizing the study of course because i don't know when it how how it's done and the results that you've obtained but it's just just my opinion okay that's fine so how would you change this then if you wanted to change this here how would you change this b if you want to eliminate b Perhaps look having a quick look at the article, which which sort of answer could we have here instead of millennials lacking soft skills? I would say millennials have uh, more soft skills than the other generations. Mm. What is the definition? Let's have a look here at the definition of soft skills. Let me have a look here. If we have another share. So define soft skills. So personal attributes that enable someone to interact effectively and harmoniously with other people. Okay. Also known as common skills or core skills, combination of people skills, social skills, communication skills, character or personality traits. Okay. So if you think that this is questionable, we could change this. Let me just, uh, instead of saying lack soft skills, because according to my study, that's one of the, let me just share again. So we could put, according to Goodman, I have more competence when compared to other countries, millennials, we could say, somebody said something here on chat. Yeah, I agree with someone when that asked. None of the answers are true, okay. Let me think here. Millennials have taught us Can you see my slide? Yes. What about this? Does it seem to be true? Yeah. Uh, that being said, I think I think that's true. No. I would say millennials are proving that they are greater at soft skills than many people 
clearing code or something like that. Okay. Does this answer look okay to you now? So this yeah, one, no, now it does. And this one would be the answer, okay. More obvious. Okay, so that one's fine. Just change that. I'll change my, my, my main slideshow after this. What about this one? Millennials do not believe that effort pays off. According to my study, millennials believe in the power of motivation. Also, as there is a lot of autocratic leadership in Portugal, I think it's important to learn about autocratic leadership because many firms have autocratic leaders in Portugal. More liberal in the UK and in the USA. We do actually see a more liberal, more liberal, a more liberal and flexible work environment in the UK and in the USA. Just to give you an example, sometimes when I address somebody in an email, I don't know whether they are a professor, professor, engineer, doctor. I'm not sure how to actually address somebody in an email. Have you ever had that problem? In other countries such as the USA or the UK, you just say, dear Antonio, dear Rui, dear Manuel. So there's no, this prefix or title um, is not so important in other countries. Okay, so that's just an example of other countries being a little bit more liberal and less status conscious than, than in Portugal, for example. Young graduates are able to change a firm's organizational country in the new technological area. Era. Actually, this is um, a source of dissatisfaction amongst young graduates because they realize that it's difficult to change organizational cultures, even in the new technological era. So a lot of graduates may be dissatisfied um, in firms because you know they, they might find a autocratic leadership style or a very closed organizational culture which might lead to some dissatisfaction. So here the true answer would be leadership practices are more liberal in the UK and the USA than in Portugal. So if you do go to firms then do expect that it might be difficult to um, change things and especially in Portugal even work processes which, is, which don't work. Okay. What about this one? What is the definition of autocratic leadership? Whereby a leader communicates to his or her employees what they have to do and expects to be obeyed free of issues and problems. Is that a definition, true definition of liderança autocratica, autocratic leadership? Yes. Yes. It's true. Leaders in Portugal want employees who are easy to manage. Fases de gerir. So this is um, a way to get ahead, if you like. É uma forma de avançar na carreira. If you are easy to manage and you give simple answers or quick answers to whatever your boss wants, your boss, he or she, that's a way to advance advancement in Portugal. What about this one, final question? Well, it's actually not the final question. It's, we could call this additional question. It's not the final question. Who is more productive? Apple with 147,000 employees or Portugal, which has 10 million citizens 4.8 million workers. Who produces more value? Quem produz mais valor? Apple or Portugal? Apple annual sales or turnover or Portugal GDP? Produto interno brut, PIB. Which is higher? Anybody have a can guess at that? Apple. Yes, unfortunately, that's true. Apple is much more productive than, than Portugal. Apple sales in 2020. $274 billion net income or profit of $57 billion. In Portugal, we're always talking about the deficit, the deficit, the deficit is normally the negative income that we have. GDP of Portugal in 2019 was $238 billion. GDP of Portugal 2020 could be around anything as low as $175 billion. So around $100 billion less than Apple, which is quite a lot of money if you think about it. But then the COVID-19 pandemic hit us very hard and the tourism sector was very, very badly affected as we just saw with tourists leaving the Algarve and other places in Portugal because of the decree and the quarantine, the new quarantine rule which the British government put into practice. So a lot of 
tourists left and that's going to have a very big effect on our on our economy looking to other countries for example slovakia and i say in terms of learning english and i say terms of young english is any yes gabriel is here so looking to other countries for example slovakia also smaller than apple 5.5 million citizens they have a gdp gross domestic product of 105 billion dollars germany on the on the other hand has a gdp of 4 trillion dollars per capita 45 and a half thousand dollars per capita portugal around half of that so about half as productive as germany slovakia a little bit less productive than portugal at 19000 dollars per capita now these are just um issues for you to look at perhaps during the summer holidays if you're interested in innovation um what is open innovation i'm sure that a lot of you already have an opinion on this open innovation means collaborating opening up the the borders of the firm to speak to universities to speak to research units to speak to other companies for it's actually cheaper to have open innovation because you're collaborating and people can help you firms can help you it's quicker because you're working in a group rather than by yourself much more radical results all you have to do is really look at apple apple works in a closed fashion and it's not really very innovative they spend billions and billions excuse me on innovation and are not especially um, innovative it's not in, well, in my perspective anyway eric von hippel is someone you can look on scopus to since 1976 he's been talking about open innovation and history henry chesper since 2003 so these are two very prominent scholars researchers henry chesper and eric von hippel from mit henry chesper since moved around a little bit since his successful article in 2003 about open innovation Clusters is also something important. Porter's diamond model. Michael Porter did a diamond model about what a cluster should have. All clusters are, diff are different. You shouldn't try and imitate Silicon Valley. I mean, we might have a cluster in San Juan de Madrid or Felgate is linked to shoes or Valdecambra. We might have different or a cluster in, in Porto, but um, do not try and copy different clusters because every cluster has a different culture, different, different industries. Um, we can go into an innovation plan if you want. Um, what should an innovation plan have? I can say straight off that it's like an adaptive marketing plan. We did do the marketing plan aspect, um, actually also involved in the group work marketing plan um, has to do with customer preferences, whether we're going to do radical innovation or incremental innovation, which resources we're going to have to hire to back up our, our innovation plan so it's like an adaptive marketing plan but more you know geared towards innovation close innovation which is what apple does a lot of secrecy your objective is to surprise the market if you talk about open innovation and collaborating with universities or other firms you need a complex contract you need trust between partners so close innovation is simpler in one respect but also much more um, expensive because you need to have really good people working for you and it'll take a longer time longer period to innovate because you're doing it all by yourself radical innovation give five examples so the internet radical innovation the smartphone the radio when it appeared the television the refrigerator frigorific cars trains online zoom lectures so all of this is what i see to be like radical even netflix versus dvds or netflix and hbo much much more convenient and comfortable to watch netflix than to go and to Blockbuster as we used to do before and rent a DVD. I don't know if you're old enough or young enough to remember Blockbuster versus in the slim room the Blockbuster. Anybody still remember Blockbuster? You're probably too, too young, but that's what the, the main DVD shop was, was called. Somebody said something here on chat. So Samuel Fabri still remembers Blockbuster. It's not too long ago. That was a fantastic firm, real good case study. All of a sudden hit rock bottom, went, went bankrupt disappeared from the market. Also USB, USB pen drives they used to be very popular, but they've been superseded by the cloud. Now we have everything on the cloud. I don't go around with USB pen drives anymore. Everything is on the cloud and very convenient, a new thing rather than USB pen drives. Incremental innovation, um, the iPhone 12, better camera, um, and MacBook PCs with new chips not made by Intel anymore. Uh, the black and white TV made the transition to a color TV. You could see that as being an incremental innovation. LED TVs, iWatch 6, 
better communication, measures oxygen level in the blood. So a few incremental innovations there. I don't think it's really radical. Prototyping, we did discuss convergent and divergent prototypes, also an important aspect of marketing because marketing should be linked to innovation and new product development. So you should know the different types of prototypes which, which exist. We can also have a look at that before the semester ends. Um, according to the Oslo manual, we discussed this um, in our last lecture. We have marketing innovation, for example, anything linked to the four Ps, new products, different way of pricing a product or paying for a product, place, you know, how we actually reach our customers over the internet, for example, is, is an internet, is a marketing innovation. Um, promotion strategies, how we communicate our products is also something new, marketing innovation. Then we have process innovation, like in the action company, um, case study, where there's a lot of responsibilization or responsibilities sound or people making people accountable, that's the word making people accountable for what they do. Okay, so this is something which is culture specific. Organizationally, in Portugal, there's not really too much accountability. In Ramtech, responsible is assigned to Portugal, but it's fast. Organizational innovation, open spaces in firms. This is a different way of organizing a firm. People being able to see each other, also to control each other, rather than being closed in a fixed office or concrete walls in an office. The idea of proximity might exist with open spaces. So this is what we call organizational innovation. These are all the different types of innovation. And marketing innovation has a very big part, plays a big part in innovation, not only product and service innovation. We also discussed what kills creativity, I believe. I think we've already discussed what kills creativity in organizations. We also know what's good for creativity, namely intrinsic motivation. Motivação intrinsica, so to actually enjoy what you do is very good for your careers and for your jobs and to be more creative. And the final slide for today, and thank you for coming, is um, these are very complex questions. So you could do uh, some research on Eric von Hippel. What has his contribution to the innovation literature been? What has he contributed? Actually he contributed with a new method called the lead user method, which you might also discuss if you have an interest in different types of innovation promotion in a firm. Henry Trespa, what was his contribution to the innovation literature? Open innovation about collaborating universities, different firms, collaborating with customers, collaborating with suppliers. This is what Henry Trespa contributed. Eric von Hippel is also um, a promoter of open innovation, but only with customers. So Eric von Hippel, the lead user method, only with what we call lead users or people who are very advanced in you know, their their habits with certain products. Clayton Christensen unfortunately passed away. I think Tiff Cancro, obviously, you know, attack could have something on mission team, something like that. Terrible, terrible health problems. He had a stroke, cancer, and a heart attack, I think, all at the same time. He did survive, still produced another book, and the Prozio Maison Lives Boys this, but then sadly passed away. He's very, very prominent in what we call disruptive innovation. If you go on Google and you write disruptive innovation, that will be. Um, one of the main topics in the innovation era. So we have, if you want to um, have a look at what's important in the innovation literature, you can look up these three very, very prominent authors, Eric von Hippel, Henry Chesper, and Clayton Christensen. And then we have the video, I think we believe we saw, I saw, we saw about Bill Gross. What is the most important element for the success of a startup and why? So you could go into a discussion on timing or luck, if you like, sort the luck of being launched or launching your product or service at the right time. Uber, taxis, not, not really a taxi service, but competing with taxis, launched when there was a crisis. Drivers who had cars wanted to get additional income, make additional income. So being an Uber driver made sense. Airbnb, according to Bill Gross, launched during a crisis. Excuse me, people wanted extra cash. So renting out a room in their house made sense for them to make some extra cash. So timing or luck, if you like it, Napoleon called it luck, all very important to the success of a startup. Actually, a few more questions. Why is it difficult to innovate? What are the barriers to innovation? We can go into this if you like. We just have a couple more lectures. Why do firms prefer people who are easy to manage? Because autocratic leaders want people who are going to agree with them and not give them any trouble. Red Ocean Strategy, what is it? Please give five examples. 
Kimon Mulborn, 2005. This is a student and teacher, very successful partnership, wrote about Red Ocean Strategy. Red Ocean Strategy is basically business. It's where there are sharks, you know, biting each other, makes the sea bloody. So it's all about the cutthroat competition, a lot of competition, which is the opposite of Blue Ocean Strategy, Oceano, Strategia Oceano Azul, where there's no competition. So the smartphone industry, 2007, iPhone launched its first iPhone, or Apple launched its first iPhone. Blue Ocean, no competition. Tablets, 2010, 2011, no, no competition. This is what a blue ocean is. And then the, the imitation comes and the copying, people copy each other, firms copy each other, makes the blood, makes up for a bloody ocean because there's a lot of competition. Also interesting to describe a, self, you know, a time when you're particularly innovative, explain why, perhaps intrinsic motivation. Is innovation important to Portuguese firms and why? For sure it's important, but is it welcomed in most Portuguese firms? Probably not. Okay. Why is it difficult to innovate in Portugal? Autocratic leadership, aversion to change, traditional society, looking to the past. Okay. So that's it for today. Thank you for coming. I think we did cover a lot of material today from big data to different issues linked to innovation. Okay, so innovation is a very, very big area. Also linked to marketing, also linked to the marketing department. Okay, because innovation is everywhere and any job that you have will be linked to innovation. Increasingly so, especially with the technological environment evolving the way it has. And big data is one of the innovations which has hit marketing really hard because of all the data, all the information you can get on your customers, potential customers, has made big data a tremendous area. And you can actually do a specific master's degree only using big data or regarding big data. It has a lot of pr computer programming. The Madrid uh, masters in big data has four different subjects only on computer programming because big data has to do with software and programming software to get all, extract all of the information and the analysis that you need. Okay, so interesting area. And all of these different authors, very prominent in innovation. If you want to study this during the holidays, I mean, also for this lecture, I will only put um, in the exam specific questions I answer in my slides or during lectures. So perhaps this is a bit too specific. Um, Eric von Hippel's contribution Henry Trespass contribution or Colleen Christensen's, Christensen's contribution. I'd say this is material for material. I mean, you have to know the basics. Henry Trespass open innovation, Colleen Christensen disruptive innovation, but I won't have a narrative question in the exam unless I have no time to correct it. So that sort of question, you'll be free from that. Okay. So thank you very much for coming. Have a great weekend. And I'll see you on Tuesday, and I'll let you know whether it'll be a physical lecture. Actually, Tuesday is normally just an online lecture too. Okay. Thank you very much then. See you. Uh, what are you doing my long time? UV, UV, UV. Um, I'll try and... I'll try to process this this fin of semana. I'll try to process this fin of semana. Eu não sei se eu, 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 eu vi ao que até formatar tudo direitinho, acredito que esteja, mas. Tá bem. Mas eu não sei quantas páginas é que mandou. Uh, são 15, 3 de, de referências. Também tem algumas imagens, tabelas. Mas está dentro das 10, eu penso que eles são, já, já não me recordo se são 10 uh, páginas. Sim, uh, acho que são 15 para os é. artigos que estão é. traduzidos em inglês. É, disse-me que utilizou o, o Grammarly, não foi? Sim, também. Ok. Portanto, isso facilita muito. Sim. Ok, combinado. Eu depois dou o feedback em breve. Se eu, não, se eu não der, eu acho que é dia 15, não é? Portanto, hoje são 11, 12, 13, 14. 11, 12, 13. Portanto, é até terça-feira. Até lá temos que conseguir acabar okay. o Não é? Sim. Ok, mas olha, muito obrigado pelo seu esforço. Se eu até segunda-feira não der feedback, podes mandar uma mensagem e eu respondo. Está bem, Mónica? Mas vou, okay. vou estar, estou com isso com, com prioridade. Muito obrigado. Obrigada, professor. Bom fim de semana. Bom fim de semana, obrigado. Sim. Sim.